We read of this man Simeon in Luke 2 and verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. This man Simeon is described as a man who was just and devout and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now perhaps for the sake of the young and perhaps some not so young I should explain the word consolation. It's a big word isn't it? Consolation. But it really simply means something that that comforts or something that cheers up in a time of sorrow. We don't live very long in this world before we discover that it's a world full of sorrow. Even little children, uh, when they've known some disappointment, uh, even little children, I'm sure the youngest child here knows times of disappointment. You know, it may be that uh, you know a favourite toy gets lost or it gets broken and the child will uh, cry and and show sorrow and so mother or father will try and comfort and so we might say well mum was consoling the child trying to comfort the child in its disappointment perhaps a child loses mum or dad uh, you know when there's a crowd around and some weeks ago some of us went to the Amberley Air Show and every little while there'd be an announcement over the PA uh, you know, about a, you know, a little boy or a little girl who was, uh, you know, at the communication centre. You know, mum and dad and the, the child had got separated. And a child can sob its eyes out, you know, when separated from mum and dad in a situation where there's a large crowd. And so somebody will try and console the child, try and comfort them, try and encourage them in their sorrow and, and their disappointment. Perhaps a trip to a favourite place had to be cancelled. Another thing that happens, isn't it? Perhaps Dad's promised a trip to McDonald's or, or whatever you know, little children like to go to these days. And then something happens and you can't go. Somebody's sick or the car breaks down or something else happens and you know, a little child can sob and cry with disappointment. And so Dad will try and console, perhaps go and buy an ice cream to, to cheer the child up. Well, the ice cream would be a consolation. But you know, sorrow can run very deep, can't it? Sorrow can run very, very deep in this world. We can think of when King Herod killed all the little baby boys in the vicinity of Bethlehem. You know, I marvel, isn't it? We, we, we're coming up to Christmas time, as we call it, and we think of it as a happy occasion, and we do have reason to rejoice that God sent his son to come to this world and to live and die on behalf of sinners and rise again. But there are a lot of sad things when you read some of the circumstances around the birth of Jesus. And one of the sad things was that King Herod, out of envy, uh, wants to all the baby boys in the two years old and under in the vicinity of Bethlehem to be killed. And we read in Matthew 2 and 18, quoting Jeremiah's prophet, says, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And doesn't it make us sad when we think of the, the, the mothers in Israel around the region of Bethlehem, you know, crying their eyes out because cruel soldiers had come and taken their two-year-old boys and slain them. And how, how, how hard it would be to console them. What consolation can you offer, you know, to a mother in a situation like that? It says they refused to be comforted. Well, think even of what we heard on our news bulletins this week and that military jet crashed in San Diego and a, and a man is contacted to be told that his wife and his two baby daughters and his mother-in-law have all perished just in one blow. You know, how, how do you console someone, you know, in a situation like that? You know, sorrow can be very deep. And when we're filled with sorrow, we're glad of consolation. We're glad of comfort. You know, we feel our sense of the need of comfort, you know, when sorrow overwhelms us. When we are sad, we need something to cheer us. 
And that's what consolation is. It's something to cheer us and to encourage us and to help us when, when we're sad and when we're sorrowful, when we're in perhaps a fearful situation. Now, this evening, I aim with God's help to do three things. I want to show you that we all need consolation. And then secondly, I want to show you from the scriptures where consolation is to be found. And finally and briefly to exhort you considering the misery of being without this consolation. This man Simeon was one of a number, not many, but one of a number who was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Well, firstly, we all need consolation. We all need consolation. Again, I want to bring four truths to your attention and we'll focus on those truths as we look at each point. But we need consolation because we fell into sin and misery in our first parents. You know, we may not like the idea that we fell in our first parents, Adam and Eve, but the scriptures teach it in many places. The whole human race was plunged into sin and misery because of disobedience to just one command of God. God only gave one restriction in the Garden of Eden, but it was to test the obedience of the human race. And as our representatives, Adam and Eve, led us and we fell into sin. Romans 5 and 12 says, Therefore, as just through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. We all sinned in our first parents, Adam and Eve. The whole human race was plunged into misery. We were a race of sinners. We're a fallen race. That's what the Word of God says. You know, we live in a created universe which was once perfect. None of us have ever known that. Only Adam and Eve knew that. What it was to live in perfect happiness, to live where there was no sorrow. So there was no need for consolation at, that, at the beginning. Because there was no sorrow. There was no disappointment. But when Adam and Eve fell into sin, there was great need for consolation. We live in a universe that's now under what we call the curse. It, the world we live in is under a curse. It's under the judgment of God. Death spread to all men, the scripture says, and with it misery. Indeed, misery came before even physical death. When our parents sinned in Genesis 3 and 16, God pronounced judgment. And he speaks to the woman, to Eve, and said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, there are three things there that are very common in terms of our misery and our afflictions. The first is sorrow. God said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow. And as I said, we don't live long in the world till we face sorrow. There's bodily pain. In pain you shall bring forth children. Of course, bodily pain is not just limited uh, to birth, is it? But pain was a result of our rebellion against God and our first parents. And then there's disruption of relationships. Your desire shall be for your husband. It's the same phrases in Genesis 4-7 about sin, sin's desire for Cain. Cain was to master it, but sin's desire was to control Cain. So there's tension in marriages. He shall rule over you. Where once there was just delight in marriage, the happiest marriage you could have imagined. But how quickly it was turned around. There was conflict in marriage. And so there's conflict in relationships. That's all part of the judgment of God because of sin. What did God say to Adam? Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so that work that was given to Adam to care for the garden, which was just bliss and delight, you know, work was meant to be enjoyable and satisfying and something by which we could glorify God and take pleasure in it. In some measure, thankfully, God at times allows it to be that. And the more grace works in our hearts, the more it is that way. But nevertheless, as part of the judgment of God, work became a toil. Cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it. And it's just not just manual work, is it? All work. Labour has become a toil. And don't we know those days, you know, when we labour and, you know, it gets to four o'clock or 4.30 and you're really struggling to keep going. Even when you've got a good job, it can be hard, can't it? Because work's become a toil. 
Cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so life is hard because of the judgment that followed man's sin. Now for hundreds of years, men and women looked for relief. They looked for comfort, they looked for consolation, they looked for encouragement in this sad situation. We read in Genesis 5, for example, of a man called Lamech, not the descendant of Cain, but a godly man. It says he lived 182 years and he had a son and he called his name Noah. And in verse 29 it says, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now this is hundreds of years after the creation. And Lamech was just so con- conscious that he was living in a world where life was hard, where work was a toil, the ground was cursed, there was bitterness, there was broken relationships. We read it as in the next chapter of Genesis of, of people killing each other and just misery and sorrow. Lamech was hopeful that in Noah this one would uh, comfort us, he says, concerning our work. He was looking for comfort. He was looking for consolation. That's what Lamech was looking for. Well, it didn't entirely come in Noah, but from Noah, of course, came the one who was truly to be consolation. But in Luke 2, we read of Simeon, a man who was looking out for the one who would be a source of cheer and comfort, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, I think there are probably many of you here tonight and really you don't need me to tell you about sorrow and misery. Some of you have lived long enough to know what it is, to know sorrow and misery. You've known great pain, perhaps physically. You've known great pain, perhaps spiritually. Perhaps you've known broken relationships, the loss of friends and great sorrows. And you've suffered a lot. And perhaps you've felt the pain of seeing others suffer which can be a great pain when you see people you love suffering. And some of you know these things, you know these things, and you know that it's not an exaggeration what I'm saying to you from the Word of God. You know what Isaiah 61 calls the spirit of heaviness, the spirit of heaviness. You know that as a reality, you've experienced it, and you know that we need consolation. Now there may be some of you for whom perhaps life is going pretty well, You know, we can go through seasons in life where it goes fairly well. Perhaps some of you are younger and you've not yet acutely felt the pain and sorrow that some of us who are a little bit older have been through and have passed through. You've not felt perhaps yet the full effects of the curse. Perhaps you're young and new in the workforce and, you know, it's all interesting and so it is. I can remember my early days as a young cadet engineer and life was quite exciting and it was quite thrilling. I was enjoying what I was doing and learning. But, you know, as the years went by, pressures came on and and work became a toil, it became hard. Pressures came on the life that I hadn't experienced when I was young. I want to say to you that one day you'll realise that we are in a fallen world. But I want to say also that we need consolation, not only because we fell in our first parents and because we live in a sin-cursed world, But we need consolation because we've sinned ourselves. We need consolation because we've sinned ourselves. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None are accepted. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are guilty sinners. We are guilty sinners. You know, at times we feel guilty. You know, we may sometimes suppress it. Sometimes we suppress our... Our, our, our guilt feelings but at, at times the law of God presses against our conscience you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind and strength and deep inside we know that we love ourselves and it comes home to us that we've not loved God as we should we feel guilty and the truth is that we are guilty we are guilty, every one of us are guilty And as life goes on, again, we start to struggle with painful memories. David said in Psalm 25, Lord, forgive the sins of my youth. Forgive the sins of my youth. And how often as we go through life, the the sins of our youth come back to us. And memories are painful because we know we're guilty. 
We can't deny the guilt. We feel our guilt and our memories condemn us. And if there is no consolation, our memories will condemn us and bring us misery for all eternity. I'm convinced that one of the great miseries of of eternity without God, going to that place which the Bible calls various things but we commonly call hell, the place of eternal misery, that one of the greatest miseries of that place will be the torment of conscience that again and again and again and again the law of God had been broken. We need consolation. Our multiplied sins upon earth, if we don't find consolation, will condemn us and make us miserable for the whole of eternity. It will be one of the great torments in the place of hell. We need consolation because of our guilt. Our guilt must be dealt with somehow. Otherwise it will rise and rise and rise and increase and increase and increase till we leave this world and go out to judgment. Now that leads me to my third sub-point here that we need consolation because we're doomed to die. We're doomed to die. And that's reality. That's reality. You know, sometimes we push it out of our minds, don't we? We push it out of our minds. Sometimes things happen to remind us that death is very close. We hear of a close relative who's got a terminal illness. Perhaps somebody close to us has a near miss with death. And we think, yes, we we are mortal. We are going to die. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and 23. That's the wages of sin. Sin pays bitter wages. The wages of sin is death. We read in Romans 5.12, death spread to all men because all sin. Sin produces death. Sin always produces death. And even now the processes of death are in a measure at work in us. Even now, although we're here living as far as our physical life goes, the processes of death are at work. We're decaying, we're declining, and we know not when God will call us out of this world. The king of terrors will eventually overtake us. And to die without consolation is the most miserable way to die. To die without any consolation or cheering thought or without something in the heart to strengthen and encourage. It's a most miserable experience. But not only are we doomed to die, but we need consolation because after death is judgment. After death is judgment. Hebrews 9 and 27, as as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment And it's by divine appointment that we die once and it's by divine appointment that we go to the place of judgment. And it's unavoidable. We can't avoid it. None of us can avoid it. I remember a friend of mine saying to me once about his father. He said he seems to think he's going to live forever. You know, his father was about 82 and just wouldn't hear of Christ and a Saviour. He seems to think he's going to live forever, my friend said to me. And the man just a year or two later passed away and as far as we know without Christ. No matter what we say or tell ourselves or tell others, the day is coming when we'll leave this world and go to judgement. And what will it be on that day when the books are opened? When every thought that we've thought is brought out and laid bare? When every word we've spoken? When every deed that we've done is measured against the yardstick of God's perfect law? What will we do if there's no consolation? if we are left on our own with guilty feelings flooding our souls and our hearts and our minds. To be judged against the standard of unbending justice. What will we do without consolation if we find ourselves in such a day? It will surely come if we do not find consolation. None will be able to deny their guilt on that day. None will dare to say to their maker, Oh, I'm not guilty. Or I'm all right, I'm a good person. None will say it on that day. The very presence of God on his throne in his awesome holiness, the consuming fire, will convict the most hardened sinner that they are guilty. Now one of the things that amazes me in life, and yet it's true, that some people do have what we might say quite strong spirits and strong resolution. You know, there are those who say and you who are Christians have probably had it said to you 
Well, religion's fine for you people who need it. You know, for you people who need it, that's fine, you know, that's cool, you know, you have it. You believe it, you know, keep it to yourself, but if you need it, you have it. I don't need a prop. I don't need a crutch, they say. And some of these people are amazing. You know, that their loved ones die and they seem to handle it reasonably well. And sometimes they suffer great losses in life and they just pop up again, even after the sorrows and the, and the troubles. And they even approach death and sometimes, you know, go to death with, a, with amazing courage, so it appears, with amazing strength. But their strength will fail them on the day of judgment. No matter how strong they are, and they may have a strong constitution, a strong emotional system. We're not all knit together the same way. Some of us are weaker emotionally, some are stronger. But that's the way we put together. But those who are so defiant and, and act so strong and say, I don't need God, I don't need religion, I don't need a prop, friends, on the, judge, on the day of judgment, they will wish they had consolation. I wonder if there's anyone here tonight thinking that, I don't need religion, I don't need God, I don't need Christ, I don't need consolation, I can handle it. Let me read just a few verses to you from Revelation 6. And note who are mentioned here, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men. You see, they're all the tough guys. They're the strong guys. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, but also every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. You see, some people stand strong for a long time in their defiance of God. They do stand strong for a long time. But when the day of his wrath comes, even the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the mighty men, the tough guys, they'll be saying, who can stand when the day of his wrath has come? Now look, my purpose is to show you that there's a time coming, if you don't see it now, that you'll need consolation. We all need consolation. Well, where is consolation to be found? Well, we come back to Luke 2. Here we come to a cheerier theme. But Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And when he had seen the Christ, the Messiah, he was content. He was ready to die. Come down to verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now do you see how Simeon responded after he'd seen the Lord's Christ? Here's this little baby, probably about 40 days old a little over a month old, a delightful little baby and he takes this baby in his arms and then he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Why? Because Simeon was seeing that which he'd longed for perhaps for many years, the consolation of Israel, the one alone in whom comfort and cheer can be found for time and for eternity. And being consoled, if you like, he's ready to die. Happy to die. To die would be gain for him, for Simeon. Now Christ is not just the consolation of believing Jews. Perhaps he was thinking of Christ particularly as a comforter to Israel. That was perhaps the thought in his mind. But he's the consolation for all who believe, Gentiles included. Philippians 2 and 1, Therefore if there is any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. And the clear implication from the passage is that there is consolation in Christ and there is comfort, the comfort of love. There is consolation in Christ, there is comfort. Now bring it back to our four points we discussed under our first heading, the need for consolation. There is consolation in Christ even though we fell into sin and misery in our father Adam. There's consolation in Christ. 
Firstly, because even before we fell, Christ had said he would stand in the place of sinners. He undertook to suffer and die for sinners, to be their representative and live a righteous life on their behalf, acceptable to God, even before we fell in our first parents. Isn't that a source of consolation? Imagine if we'd just fallen in sin with no hope of salvation, with no saviour, with no one to stand in our stead. Think how miserable we'd be. But Christ had already promised to step in on behalf of sinners, even before we fell in our father Adam. But not only that, he came to this world as Emmanuel, God with us. God in human flesh. That's why we rejoice, don't we, at Christmas time. It's not a holy day, but it's good to stop and give thanks, to be glad that our Saviour came. And he came, God the Son, the eternal God in human flesh. And so he suffered all the bitter effects of sin. He did not sin himself, but the bitter effects of sin he, he bore. He did that in his life. He knew poverty. You know, the famous verse, you know, how there was no room for them in the inn. Born in a stable, in a feeding trough. Born into poverty. So poor that even in the portion that was read, his parents brought two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Too poor to bring a bull or a goat or a, or a sheep, a lamb. It was only the poor who were allowed to bring uh, these two birds. He was born into poverty. Poverty is an effect of sin. Poverty is an effect of sin. Pain, he was born into pain. He knew pain through his life. He knew the pain of hunger. Forty days and forty nights without eating. Think of the pain of that. He knew the pain, emotional pain, friends deserting him, even betrayed by one of his closest friends who used to sit at a table and eat with him. That's painful. He knew the pain of thirst. Draws up at that well, as we read in John 4. Ask the woman to draw water. Thirsty in a hot day. You know, we go to our taps on days like this and we pour out the water. Our good God is to us. But, you know, they went to a well, you know, after travelling. Thirsty, the pain of thirst, the pain of hunger. He knew the pain of hatred. They hated him without a cause. All he did was deeds of kindness and love all through his life. He healed the sick, he cast out the demons, he raised the dead, the lepers were cleansed. A life of good, and yet they hated him. The rulers ganged against him and plotted him, plotted to put him to death. Yes, there are many things that our Lord suffered, but all these things he suffered that he might be perfectly equipped to help us. Perfectly equipped to help us. Hebrews 2, 17 to 18, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. No matter what temptation comes to us through suffering, Christ is able to help. He's able to be a consolation and he's ready and willing Hebrews 4 and 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You know how full of grace is the Lord Jesus Christ, ever willing to even be a comforter and to be a consolation, even in the misery of this world, even when we're suffering with pain and rejection and sorrow and broken relationships, all of these things. He's full of grace. And what real comfort he gives in times of sorrow. You know, human comforters can help. Sometimes a good friend, a good comforter can help. But none can reach the heart like Christ can. None can reach the heart as he can. And especially in times of temptation and times of spiritual struggle. Who can comfort us like Christ? Who can comfort like Christ can? And he does and he's willing. And he does that to all who trust him as Lord and Saviour. But think of our second point, that we're all sinners. You see, there's consolation in Christ for sinners. Why is there consolation in Christ for sinners? Because it's sinners he came to save. See, it's depressing in one sense that we're all guilty. It's sad that we're all sinners. And it makes us sorrowful, and so it ought to. But it's sinners Jesus came to save, and that's why there's consolation in him. 
1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the primary reason he came, to save sinners. And this is the supreme proof of the love of God. Yeah, sometimes life is hard, isn't it? And sometimes we know great disappointment. But often we who are Christians come back to this great supreme proof of the love of God. Romans 5 and 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was while we were sinners, not good people, not wonderful people who obeyed God's law and pleased him. It was while we were sinners. And what a proof of God's love. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we've driven to Calvary's cross. You know, to think only of Jesus' birth and to not trace the journey through his life and to come to Calvary is a big mistake because there's really more comfort, there's more consolation at Calvary. Awful though the scene is of a bleeding and dying saviour, one whose appearance was marred more than any man, the blood no doubt streaming down, no doubt the body emaciated and almost beyond recognition. It's a terrible sight. But in fact, that's where there's consolation for the sinner. Because it's at Calvary that we find pardon and forgiveness. And there's nowhere else to go. If we stop short and just sing carols about Jesus born at Bethlehem, we'll never find salvation. We must come to Calvary. That's where there's consolation. Jesus had no sins of his own to die for. He died for the sins of others. And that's where there's consolation. We come to Calvary and say, here's a man, a perfect man, a righteous man, not only a man, but God in human flesh, dying such a cruel and painful and bitter death for sinners. Why? Well, it must speak of great love. Because he wasn't dying for his own sins. And it wasn't an accident. It was God's purpose. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief, the scripture says. Yes, even the father put to grief his own son. Why? Because of love for sinners. Well, there again, there's consolation, you see, in Christ. Because he died for sinners. But where else will you find consolation if you don't go to Christ? That's what I want to urge you all to think about from youngest to oldest tonight. Where else will you find consolation? Where else will your guilt be taken away? Where else will you find consolation on your deathbed, on the day of judgment? You see, there's consolation in Christ when death comes. That great psalm that God's people have loved for centuries, Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See those words, you are with me. Christ draws near to dying saints. He does draw near to dying saints. He draws near in a special and a particular way. Why? Because he's been to the grave. Jesus has been to the grave and he's conquered the grave and come forth. (coughs) But he knows what it's like and he draws near to dying saints. He upholds as no other can. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, every other staff is like the broken reed of Egypt, unable to give any real help. Because who can really comfort when death comes? Who can really comfort? But Christ can, and he does. And I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen those who know the Lord die, and I've witnessed the Lord upholding their spirit even as their bodies have been wasting away in a most terrible manner. And yet the spirit's upheld by Christ drawing near, giving to them the bright expectation of glory. It'll be good to go home, my mother said, as she was dying. The body was just wasting away. You know, a sad sight to behold. But the spirit was just upheld in a way that man couldn't do. A man couldn't do it. It wasn't just a psychological trick. My mother wasn't on any drugs when she was saying these things. Her mind was clear and she was suffering and knew the reality of suffering. It'll be good to go home, she says. You know, the spirit was just upheld in an amazing way. The believer can say, to die is gain. You see, there's consolation 
There's consolation in Christ when death comes. But what about on the day of judgment? Well, I bring to you Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, we can be confident that on the day of judgment, if we've fled to Christ, there will be no condemnation. I don't know whether Jesus will say it, but he will put on the day of judgment to every believer who trusts him and loves him, say, no condemnation. I died for him. I died for her. My blood was shed for him. My blood was shed for her. No condemnation. No one can bring a charge. Who shall bring a charge against God's elite? It is God who justifies there will be great consolation in Christ on the day of judgment. Why, well, I think we who are Christians will love Christ more than ever on that day when we see what he's really delivered us from. No, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not guilty is the verdict. Well, as we draw to a conclusion, I want to plead with you tonight. Any of you who have not come to Christ, think of the misery of your condition if you do not come to the one who is the consolation of Israel. When trouble comes in this life, you'll have no real consolation. Friends may help to a degree. But you know, life might be going well, but wealth can fail. Some people's wealth has failed in the last 12 or 18 months. When we were in the USA 12 months ago, there were houses everywhere with signs outside saying repo, short for repossession, empty houses. People just had to leave them in financial ruin. Wealth, wealth can fly away very quickly. Riches take their wings and fly away. Health can fail. We don't know. We don't know when we'll collapse. We don't know when the, we'll go to the doctor with what we think is not too serious and he'll come out and say, I've got bad news for you. We don't know when that'll happen. Friends can fail us. Some who we thought we could trust, they'll depart from us. It happens. Even family sometimes fails. Now security, we have great freedom, don't we, in this country. All of these things can fail us. And only Christ gives consolation that reaches the heart in those circumstances. Even Job lost everything, including his health, and yet he could say, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end I shall stand on the earth. He would see his Redeemer with the very eyes resurrected in his resurrection body. And even if we don't lose anything, even if we don't lose everything, even in this life, can your mind really be at rest while you're not reconciled to God? Can your mind really be at rest? Why is it so many people go to the bottle shop every night or people turn to drugs? It's just that uneasiness that something's not right. Can the mind really be at rest while we're not reconciled to God? Not really. We have to suppress what our conscience is telling us. So what will you do with your guilt? What will you do with your guilt if you don't come to the only one who can bring you consolation? If you don't come to the only one who can take it away? Do you really think that you're not a sinner? That you've not broken God's law? The soul that sings, it shall die. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a consolation? And what consolation will you find in death? You may have a deathbed, you may not. But if you lie with the body wasting away, the skin perhaps pale, perhaps sweating, sometimes hot, sometimes cold, sometimes even the body convulsing, where will you be without Christ, who alone can give deep consolation to die with nothing to look forward to except the place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth friends I don't say these things just to be dramatic the Lord Jesus spoke often of that place and that's all there is to look forward to if we die without coming to Christ who is the consolation of Israel the consolation of all who trust him what will you do on the day of judgment it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, to die without consolation, to die deserted and forsaken and to be alone. Some people think in hell their mates will be there. Hell is the loneliest place you could possibly imagine. We can't imagine the loneliness. No one will be there on the day of judgment to come along and help you and console you. You'll stand before the judge with no consolation. No one will help you. Your sinful mates won't help you. 
None will help you if you're not come to the consolation of Israel. And so I beg you and I urge you and I plead with you to go to Christ. Because it's Jesus who said, Come unto me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said that him that comes to me I will never drive away. The disciples understood that when many were deserting Jesus because some of the sayings were hard. Remember Peter's words, to whom shall we go when Jesus said, will you go also? To whom shall we go, said Peter, you have the words of eternal life. There's no one else to go to. There is no other consolation that reaches the heart that will really help. And so I want to say to you, go to Christ while you can. Because Jesus loves to receive sinners. He has said he will not drive away anyone who comes to him. He invites you to come. And God the Father commands you to come. So why not go? Why disobey? Why refuse the greatest invitation in the universe? Go to Jesus and you will find pardon and forgiveness and consolation for this life and for the world to come. Or may the Spirit bring some this night to Christ who is the consolation of all who trust him.